Of all the careers in all the world that a person could aspire to, you ended up a professional space traveler. What was it that motivated you or inspired you to become an astronaut? I think I have always been interested in aviation. My father was a naval aviator, flew airplanes for a lot of years. And so growing up, I was always around airplanes. And for a number of years, we lived at Moffett Field Naval Air Station, which is also where the Ames Research Center is when I was in high school. And we used to see astronauts come out there to do some of their training. And they'd park their T-38s out there on the ramp and come in for training. And I thought, well, that looks like a pretty neat job. But mostly, it made me interested in the space program in general, because that seemed like kind of a long shot to ever get selected to be an astronaut. But um, I liked the idea, and I sort of tucked it away in my head and um, studied aerospace engineering in, in college and um, got interested in some other things along the way, but, uh, but always came back to the idea of being an astronaut. And what appeals to me about it is um, I think that you, it's a very, cha you know, it's a challenging job. You are um, looking at lots, of, you know, having to know lots of different things. You have to be a generalist as well as a specialist in, in some areas. Um, and of course, it's just, just a lot of fun. I like to ask people about their hometowns, and, and you said you don't have one. I don't. Um, I am an, a military brat. As I said, my dad was a, a naval officer, so we grew up moving around all over the world. Um, I was born in Hawaii, and uh, we moved through California to Japan to England, Rhode Island, um, back, to, back and forth to California over the years. That's where my family is now, so I do consider California my home state, um, um, but not really. I don't really have a hometown. Do you have a sense of, of how living in that many different places contributed to making you the person that you are today? I think it helps you adapt to different situations and um, of course it makes you close to your family because as you move around that's that's your close group of friends that you have with you um, but I do think it helps you um, get comfortable in new situations pretty quickly you have to learn that skill and uh, I think that's an, it's a valuable skill. Well, you, you said that you ended up in California, I, I think, for high school, right? Take us from there and, and give me the thumbnail sketch of your education and, and your professional career before you came to NASA. Well, I went to high school in the California Bay Area near Moffett Field Naval Air Station. And uh, then I went to university at the University of California in Los Angeles. And I studied aerospace engineering there for four years. And um, towards the end of my um, studies at UCLA, I got interested in a project with some other aerospace engineering students that was called the Human Powered Submarine Races or Human Powered Submarine Project. And what we did basically was we built a small two-person submarine um, and raced it against some other colleges. And um, it's kind of funny that you know a bunch of aerospace engineering students got interested in this, but a friend of mine, uh, Derek, who was going into the Navy as a submarine officer, had read about this project and decided he wanted to participate and talked all of us into doing that. And um, as part of that project, I ended up being the, the pilot for the sub because um, as the only girl, I was the smallest and the only one that would fit in the spot that we had designated for the pilot. Um, it's, it was a pedal-powered submarine, so we gave all the room to the guy that was going to be driving the propellers. And um, I had to get scuba certified in order to, um, to do this project because the submarine is flooded. It's full of water. And so basically the process of getting scuba certified and, and starting to learn about the oceans um, was very appealing to me. And I got interested in ocean engineering at that time and ended up working for a few months um, uh, at an ocean engineering company in San Leandro, California. Um, they design underwater robots and some manned submersibles as well. And uh, did that for a few months and then uh, did sort of my post-college wandering. I went to Ireland actually for a few months and I worked in a dive shop down in uh, southwest uh, Cork. And that was a lot of fun. Loved being around the ocean, in the ocean all the time. And ended up going to graduate school uh, for oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, but sort of oceanography oceanography for engineers. Um, the program was called Applied Ocean Sciences and I studied in particular underwater acoustics, so what we can learn about the ocean by uh, using sound. And I did that for six years, but I always kind of held on to this idea that being an astronaut would be, would be pretty exciting and pretty challenging. And so at one point during my um, graduate career, I went ahead and applied to NASA and um, uh, just got really lucky and got interviewed and, and got hired. Tell me about what it was like when you got the news that you'd been assigned to your first flight. Well, um, the week that the week leading up to the announcement, um, I was actually working in Mission Control Center, and I was working the night shift. 
So I wasn't going into my office at all. I wasn't going by my desk. And so the chief of the astronaut office, Steve Lindsay, makes the phone calls. And he had been calling me at my desk. And of course, I wasn't there. <laughs> I was going to work, but I just wasn't, wasn't going to my desk. And so the word was getting out amongst the crew, folks who were, had already heard. And they had also heard who else was going to be on the crew. And so the word was getting out a little bit. But I was one of the last people to find out. So. Um, one of the things that happened was uh, coming in um, to mission control, I had to slam shift from working the night shift to working days, and I still hadn't come into the office. And I ran into our pilot on the crew, who I see occasionally, and he said, uh, he said, have you talked to Scooter lately? Well, Scott Altman's Scooter is, is the crew commander, but not somebody that I would see very often or, or talk to on a regular basis. And I said, no, why do you ask? And he said, oh, I... And he had this really funny look on his face, and he said, I was just wondering if he knew how he was doing, <laughs> which was very suspicious to me. But I had to go to work and, and, and work a, a shift in mission control, and I didn't have a whole lot of chance to think about it. But when I got home that night and uh, my phone rang and it was uh, Steve Lindsay, um, I, I finally knew what was going on, and, and he asked me, did I want to be on the, on the crew for the servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. So. Well, Megan, we know that flying in space can be dangerous. I'm curious what it is that you think we get as a result of flying people in space that makes this risk one you're willing to take. Well, I don't think we can do what we do without flying people in space. We don't have the robots and machines to do the tasks that we've chosen to do in space. Um, why I think flying in space, why exploration is important to me, I think it's important to the human spirit. It's something that we have always done pushed beyond the boundaries of what we know, what we can do, what we can build. Um, we're always pushing ourselves. We're always um, looking to find out what's out there and what we can learn. I think it's a very natural thing for humans to do, and we just happen to be right on the edge of that. When was the first time you ever heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? The first time I ever heard of the Hubble Space Telescope was when I was a college student at UCLA and I was studying aerospace engineering and uh, interested in NASA and in the space program as maybe a future career opportunity, not with a specific idea of what I might do, but um, just in general interested in the space program. What is it that you think Hubble has meant both to astronomy and to space exploration? How has it made a big contribution? Well, I'm not an astronomer, but I can tell you that Whenever I talk to people, they've, everyone has heard of the Hubble Space Telescope and seen the images that have come back from some of the instruments and are fascinated by what they see in those images, not only because they're beautiful um, to the eye, but also because of the questions that are asked and also answered by looking at these images. And when I learn about what it is that we're seeing, what these images represent, it really is fascinating and it's kind of mind-boggling. And I think that as human beings, we're very curious about the world around us and, of course, about the universe around us. And these images help to sort of answer some of those questions, but also encourage us to ask more because we are very curious, I think. There are a lot of people involved in getting you and your crewmates ready to fly this mission, and not just here in Houston. Tell me about the training and the support that you've received from the people uh, behind the Hubble at the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Space Telescope Science Institute. We've been out to Goddard and the Space Telescope Science Institute a couple of times and met the folks that work on, uh, on the telescope and with the images. And it's an amazing group of people, so enthusiastic, so excited that we're doing this mission. And when I've met some of these people and they tell me their stories about how for 20 years they've been part of this project practically, it's amazing. And it, it's very exciting and you want to do your best work to help you know these people with the dream that they've been working on for 20 years. And I've sort of come lately to this, to this project, but it's very inspiring to meet them and it sort of gives you a sense of responsibility that you want to do your best work for them. And of course, it's no surprise that the people who work on the project love the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's become something of an icon outside of the science community, too. Uh, what is it that you think that uh, it is about Hubble that gets people so excited about it? I do think it's the imagery that gets produced from some of the instruments on the telescope that get published and really captures the imagination of the general public that see those images. They're beautiful, and what they represent is fascinating, I think, not just to scientists, but to everyday folks. And as we see images and we hear about data that tells us, hey, there are other planets out there that are similar to planets we have in our own solar system, that really captures the imagination. Uh, and I think human beings are just very curious about what else is out there. The pictures are great. What's your favorite Hubble image? It's really hard to pick a favorite. Um, I, I like the Cat's Eye Nebula. I think it's a beautiful image. 
and I think it's also very interesting for how it shows sort of a, the life cycle of a star or the death of a star. Uh, another favorite is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, which we have as our background for our crew portrait. And what I like about that image is basically, as I understand it, they pointed the telescope at a very dark part of the sky, what looks like a dark part of the sky to us. And they pointed it in the same place for you know, many uh, orbits, a week long, basically, looking at the same part of the sky. And what they discovered was hundreds of galaxies in this one part of the sky that when we look at it, it looks like there's nothing there. And we can see back in time 13 billion years. That's amazing to me. Uh, it's just fascinating. It just it makes you, you know, makes your jaw drop. Your mission specialist on this flight to the Hubble Space Telescope. Megan, summarize the goals of the mission and tell me what your main jobs are. Well, this is the fifth servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. And what we're going to do is basically extend the life of the telescope for another few years, another five years at least, hopefully. And uh, we're also going to repair and upgrade some of the instruments on board the telescope. And uh, the way we're going to do that is by capturing the telescope and placing it in the shuttle's payload bay. And then some of our crew members will do five different spacewalks to do this repair and upgrade work. And you're going to be at the controls of the arm for all of this? I'll be driving the robotic arm for all of the EVAs. Um, our commander, Scott Altman, is also an arm operator, and he will be uh, there to back me up on the EVAs as well as he'll be the primary arm operator for one of the five. After the loss of Columbia, this final Hubble servicing mission was canceled. It was decided that it was too risky to send a crew for that. But that decision was reversed almost two years ago. Here you are. What was your feeling about the decision not to fly to Hubble, and then when the, your feeling about that decision being changed? Well, the decision not to fly to Hubble, as you say, was made uh, after the Columbia accident. And, of course, I was disappointed that we were going to not be, not be participating in the, in the Hubble mission anymore. Um, I didn't have a personal connection at that time to the telescope, but I was just disappointed that we had lost a capability that we had demonstrated in the past. Um, when they made the decision to return to the telescope, they sort of announced that decision at the same time they announced which crew members were going to be going. So, of course, I was immediately involved in, in that. And so uh, my attachment to the telescope grew pretty rapidly on, on hearing that announcement. So I was thrilled, um, not only because we're, we are participating in something that's going to really contribute to the body of scientific knowledge, but, but also because I personally am going <laughs> to get my first space flight. Well, on this flight, uh, like all shuttle flights now, you, the crew is going to do a thorough inspection of the vehicle using the orbiter boom sensor system. Right. Tell me about how that's accomplished and what it is that you're looking for. Well, the orbiter boom sensor system is a 50-foot long boom um, that resides on the other side of the payload bay from the robotic arm. And on the end of that boom, it has a package of sensors that can help give us basically a 3D image of what the thermal protection system looks like on the orbiter. So what we do is we take the robotic arm, we pick up this boom, and then we use it as an extension basically of the robotic arm to reach all of these different areas on the orbiter that we're interested in. And we have a team of engineering experts who have determined which parts of the orbiter we need to look at and how closely we need to look at them and um, determine you know, if there are any cracks or problems with the thermal protection system that would need to be repaired in order for us to return safely home. Now, there, we practiced uh, me different means of repairing a shuttle on orbit, been tested out since the return to flight. What kinds of damage could you guys fix if, if you found it? There are um, cracks of up to a certain size that can be repaired. There are also holes that can be covered. Um, so there's a variety of different um, methods that we're looking at to, to potentially repair problems. And then it also, of course, repairs it depends on where that problem is. There are some areas of the thermal protection system that are more critical than others and can only withstand very small damages. Well, unlike other shuttle flights, yours does not have the option of waiting at the International Space Station for another ride home if it turns out that Atlantis can't make the trip back through right. the atmosphere. Explain to us what the options are in terms of a rescue. Well, the plan, and, and this plan had to be developed before we could make the decision, obviously, to do this mission, but the plan is to have another orbiter ready to go on the launch pad or very near to being on the launch pad in order to launch to come and get the crew on board Atlantis to come and get us. And so um, if we determine um, by the initial inspection and then further focused inspections on the area of interest that we couldn't repair any damage that we had sustained, they would send another crew up to come and get us. How does that work? How, do, how does 
two shuttles get together and crew train? That's a good question, and we haven't done any specific training on that scenario yet, but um, we do have some of our crew members following the development of that scenario, and basically what we would do is we would rendezvous with the other shuttle or that shuttle would rendezvous with us in orbit just as you would rendezvous say with the telescope or with the space station and um, then we would use or they would use their robotic arm to grapple our shuttle and every person would go out in a spacewalking suit and cross over to the other space shuttle. That would definitely be the unplanned EVAs. Yes. All the work that you've been training to do to get Hubble back up running at full speed depends on successfully getting it into the shuttle's payload bay so that you can do the work. Uh, Tell me about the part that you play in those operations and then describe how you're going to go about getting the telescope out of the sky and onto that work platform. Well, the first thing we have to do is rendezvous with the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit, and that really is a full crew effort. Uh, the commander runs the show, obviously, but the pilot and um, pretty much all of the mission specialists are involved in that effort. And what we do is a series of burns, basically, to catch up with the Hubble Space Telescope in the orbit that it's in. Um, once we have match rates with the telescope, the commander, Scott Altman, and myself work together to basically hand over control. As soon as we're comfortable that the orbiter's rate has been matched to the telescope and the telescope looks to me like it's stable and not moving, um, then I take the robotic arm, the shuttle's robotic arm, and I reach out and grab the telescope. And there is a, a grapple fixture, a pin basically, on the side of the telescope that we use. Uh, uh, the robotic arm grabs onto that. Once we have a good capture of the telescope, I then maneuver the robotic arm um, to install the telescope into a berthing mechanism at the back end of the shuttle payload bay. And uh, once we have uh, installed the telescope in that berthing mechanism, we latch it down and I can release the uh, shuttle's robotic arm. When you were discussing the trying to match rates, I guess you're, you're, if I understand it right, you're trying to get the shuttle and telescope to flying in formation together so exactly. they're not moving uh, so that you've got a good target to shoot at. That's exactly right. Um, how much mobility, how much, how much quick response does that arm have to be able to, to, to get that grapple fixture if it's moving? Well, the idea would be for the telescope to be moving only very slightly or um, not at all hopefully um, but, but but very slightly with respect to the arm um, so that we can do a nice controlled smooth approach to the grapple fixture and and do a clean grapple if the telescope does have a rate on it it's rotating say with respect to us I can match that rate with the robotic arm and still go in for a grapple and we practice that extensively here at uh, Johnson Space Center I have a, um, an instructor that spends a lot of time with me going over just that very scenario. What is it like to, I know you haven't done it in real life, but what, what's it like to, to fly a 50 foot long robot? Um, it's actually, you know, like you say, I haven't actually done it yet, um, but I think the simulators here are very good and show us what that, um, what the induced motion would look like as I control the robotic arm from inside. And it sort of depends on what you're doing. What you're doing. Some things are very, um, you know, when we when we fly the robotic arm for the EVAs, I'm just sort of moving wherever the crew member tells me to move. And you know, if you're far away from structure, then you you're not. You know, you're not really worried about running into anything, but some of the things we do are a little bit closer to structure and uh, sort of more critical in that sense, and so it, it sort of ups your awareness of, uh, of what you're doing. Right after the birthing, I, I think, there's a couple of hours in timeline set aside for you guys to do a survey of the telescope. What is it that you're looking for then? Basically, we're looking at um, how the telescope may have changed since the last time anybody saw it. So uh, they'll take a lot of pictures and send them to the ground um, to compare with the last set of pictures that they took before the Hubble was released um, from the previous servicing mission. And then also we're looking for anything that might be of concern to the folks that are going to go out doing a spacewalk on the telescope. Maybe uh, some paint is peeling off or there might be um, you know, maybe a micrometeoroid hit uh, on the telescope that might cause a jagged edge on something that the crew member needs to put their hand on. So they're just looking for anything that they can see that they want to be uh, cautious about when they go out there. Is that survey for still cameras and video? Yes. Okay, the timeline you mentioned earlier calls for five spacewalks to be conducted over five days. Uh, tell me about how you guys inside Atlantis are dividing up the responsibilities from helping the spacewalkers get ready to go outside to running the robotic arm to working with Houston, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I can tell you that everybody's pretty busy all the time. Yeah. Um, there will be two 
uh, spacewalking crew members on any given day that's actually going out the door. The other two crew members will help them get suited up as well as the commander and pilot will be helping them to get suited up as well. And then once the crew members are out the outside the airlock, um, the two EVA crew members that remain inside basically choreograph that spacewalk from inside. They have um, the, the playlist, if you will. They're going to be telling the folks outside exactly every step that they need to do, what tools they need to have, and they're going to be guiding them, guiding them throughout the process. Um, I'll be driving the robotic arm uh, throughout each one of those spacewalks. There's always one of the crew members on the end of the arm, and I help put them into position to do their work so they can be hands-free. They're not having to hold on to stabilize themselves. I can put them in a stable position position so they can do their work. And then the commander is always up there as well, backing me up on the arm and then also just prepared for anything that might happen that's unexpected. So we all keep pretty busy. What is it that makes the job of running the uh, shuttle robotic arm a challenge in your mind? Um, that's a good question. I think the thing that is um, that is potentially challenging about driving the robotic arm is when you are getting close to objects and you can't see them well. And so um, we have lots of camera views as well as, of course, the out the window view to see what we're doing. But there are some things that I just can't see. And so I'm relying on the crew member that's outside on the arm or near the arm to help me stay away from hitting anything because of course the last thing you want to do is hit the telescope or hit one of the crew members and so we have to really work closely together to do that and frequently or really always the EVA crew member is really concentrating and focusing on their task and what they're doing and so we have to find the right kind of communication so that we get the information back and forth that we need. I've talk to other people who've run robotic arms and they say it's almost like developing another language to learn how to clearly verbally communicate with those people. It certainly is a, a clear and concise communication is very helpful and it's the kind of communication that we try to use in a lot of different aspects of, of flying in, in space. I've worked for a number of years as a CAPCOM, a capsule communicator from the Mission Control Center and um, really working any procedure you want to have that clear and concise communication. We also try to use that type of communication when we're flying T-38s um, uh, with air traffic control and with other airplanes and so um, it's something that you develop really in lots of different ways in the training program here um, and it's not necessarily unique to the robotic arm but certainly when there's a lot of other communication going on you want to be as brief and as clear as you can be. When it comes to the arm operations during these five spacewalks, are you serving as a work platform or are you moving large pieces of equipment? Both. Um, sometimes there is a crew member riding on the end of the robotic arm and they are carrying a large piece of equipment. Some of these new instruments are the size of a baby grand piano or the size of a telephone booth and that's, that's kind of what they look like. And so we have to be very careful with the rate at which we move and um, as we're moving towards structure, you know, that we have good clearances and that kind of thing. Um, other times there's just the crew member by themselves working with tools on the telescope um, with no additional, you know, heavy object that they're carrying. And then other times there'll be no crew member on the robotic arm and it's just there as a tool platform for the crew member that's working nearby can reach over and grab the items that they need off the tool stanchion on the robotic arm. As far as the uh, equipment that you're going to install, it seems to me that it kind of breaks up into two categories. There's cameras of some form or fashion, and then there's other hardware that points the telescope, that's, that's used to help point the telescope right. in the right place. Um, g give me a sense of, of the, the kinds of things you're going to be putting in there. Um, well, the, uh, there's lots of different um, items that we're going to be putting into the telescope. One of the first things that we'll do is, are the rate sensing units is a very high priority item. Uh, the gyroscopes, as you say, it help uh, point the telescope at what they want to look at. And uh, there are uh, three positions for that. There are six total, but um, two in each package. And the crew member in, is inside the telescope in very close quarters and really having to, to be very careful with um, not running into any of the other equipment that's in there um, to potentially damage it or get it off kilter and um, that person one of them is on the end of the robotic arm and so we have to be very careful with how we move and make sure that somebody is always looking um, at the, the, the thing that's nearest to us so that we don't run into it so that's that's a pretty challenging task um, and we you know there's a crew member on the end of the robotic arm taking an instrument out and we'll run back and forth to these storage 
carriers basically in the payload bay to get out the new equipment. Um, so they get the old damaged piece of hardware out, and we, we run over, we get a new piece, and, we, and then we take it back inside. Um, those are sort of smaller pieces of hardware. Then there are the larger pieces of hardware that we talked about that are sort of maybe grand piano sized, and so those are carriers that get opened up, and then the crew member pulls this instrument out. Um, and again, we do that, try to do that very slowly. There's very delicate parts of the instrument um, that we don't want to bump into anything, and so uh, the crew members have to work together to orient that instrument, and then they're working with me as well to tell me where they need to go. Um, uh, the wide field camera is like that. The fine guidance sensor is like that. And um, then the, there's an instrument called COS that's a spectrograph that is looks like a telephone booth to me. And uh, again, a very large instrument that's um, in, in sort of very close quarters in a carrier that's near the telescope. And um, it's a little bit challenging with the, with the lack of views. And so again, I'm relying on the spacewalking crew members to, to look around and, and make sure the arm is clear from structure before I move. And, and the, the guys that are going to be out there, some of those tasks they're doing are things that they were never supposed to do. They, right. they weren't designed to be done right. in space. Right. They're doing a couple of repairs uh, on some instruments that have broken down over the last couple of years, and the scientists that use them really want them back. The data is very valuable and very unique and produces, uh, in the case of the advanced camera for surveys, produces some of the beautiful images that we're used to seeing. And so um, basically there's some circuit cards in there that have fried, and the crew members are going to be pulling them out on orbit, and this involves removing a hundred tiny screws that weren't designed to be removed in space and so um, you know we have a team of engineering experts that have come up with an ingenious solution to this problem but the crew members are basically you know inside the telescope removing this hundred tiny screws in order to get at a circuit card um, in this in these instruments and and then replace it and so um, it requires a lot of very fine motor skills on their part and of course they're wearing these big oven mitts on their hands which makes it very challenging um, those particular spacewalks for me as the robotic arm operator um, you know I'm sort of parked nearby um, in order to, to give them access to the tools that they might need but those are some very exp exciting spacewalks for our team and we're really looking forward to good success there after five spacewalks complete, it comes time to put Hubble back to work. Right. Describe the plan for a, a possible reboost and then for releasing the telescope and leaving it in a stable condition in orbit. Well, as I understand the plan for reboost, um, after the last EVA, the fifth EVA, will conduct the reboost, uh, set up the, for the reboost that evening, and then the next morning, um, we'll use the robotic arm to grapple the telescope in its berthing mechanism, and then we'll move it out of that berthing mechanism and away from the orbiter and once I release the telescope just very smoothly back away from it then the commander will take control of the orbiter and back the orbiter away from the telescope and then we do a series of burns to get farther away from it. Now in case something doesn't go the way we planned or we can't release it or the telescope isn't operating as we expect it to we have two of our crew members, uh, spacewalking crew members, ready to go out the door to do a contingency EVA to help with that process. So um, we'll see. I guess one of the, the things that, as the arm operator, that you've got to be concerned about is to make sure that when you release it, it's steady and not turning in some way. Right. You certainly want to do a clean, smooth back away. You don't want to tip off the telescope and, and have and, and do some kind of motion that uh, that's not expected. So what I plan to do is just a real nice, smooth back away and, and get away from the telescope so that we're clear of it as we back the orbiter away. And you and your crewmates are going to be the last people to ever lay eyes on Hubble as it floats away. Any thoughts about what that's going to be like? Um, I think it will be a pretty special moment for all of us. Um, I don't know, I don't really know how that's going to feel. I'm still thinking about what it's going to feel like to see it for the first time. It's kind of neat, I think, that there's a need for a crew of human beings to go to get a robot telescope in shape to continue its mission in space. Megan, what are your thoughts about the future of space exploration and how those two components, the, the human and, and the robotic, are going to have to work together to make the whole thing work? Well, I think you're right that it will always be human and robotic working together in space exploration. We don't have the capability yet. We may never have the capability for robots to duplicate the, um, the processing power, basically, of a human being. And so having that relationship where humans are interacting with machines to complete the task, I think, is something that we're always going to, we're always going to be using that method.